For centuries, mankind has looked to the heavens for answers, scouring the globe in search of knowledge, leaving no stone unturned, no depth unexplored. Since AGU's ambitious beginnings in 1919, the pace of discoveries that better our world has been rapid and transformative for humanity. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Earth and space scientists like you have brought science to life. Your discoveries have irrevocably changed the way we see the world and the life that inhabits it. You have helped advance society. As we look to the future, we must drive the next transformational era of Earth and space science for the benefit of humanity, to build an inclusive community of scientists, to grow public support of our work, to build a more sustainable world. Over the next 12 months, as AGU celebrates our centennial, the most essential ingredient is you. Bring public attention to the value of science. AGU's Celebrate 100 grants offer funding for grassroots engagement activities that showcase the benefits of Earth and space science. Share your story. Use the StoryCorps app to record your experiences or be interviewed by others about your life's work and the challenges you've faced along the way. The stories you pass on and the challenges you've overcome are what inspires our shared future. Be part of Centennial. Be part of our shared future. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome AGU President Eric Davis. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here this afternoon. After all the amazing speakers and presentations uh, that you've heard this week, we have another great lineup for you today. These speakers have some exciting presentations representing AGU's 25 sections covering topics from the Earth's core to the solar system and beyond. I first mentioned in my introduction to the President's Forum lecture featuring Lisa Jackson, Apple's Vice President of Environment, Society, and Social Initiatives, and former administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, that this fall meeting would serve as the kickoff to AGU's centennial celebrations. We hope you've enjoyed the celebratory atmosphere with events ranging from focused idea labs to develop Celebrate 100 grant program applications to recording personal narratives and creating a catalog of Earth and space science history to a variety of intriguing public events hosted around Washington, D.C. The discussion and presentations you'll see today will continue what we hope has been an inspirational launch to AGU Centennial. As a member of the organization's leadership, I'm incredibly proud of the knowledge uncovered by the Earth and space science community that AGU represents. It's impressive to think that everyone in this room has built upon the science and research that came before, and now, at this pinnacle in AGU's history, we'll be able to influence a new and transformative era of Earth and space science. To get today's celebration of our science started, I'm pleased to introduce past AGU president Tim Grove who currently serves as the Robert R. Schrock Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and as the chair of AGU's Centennial Steering Committee. Tim was just awarded the Harry H. Hess Medal on Wednesday, an honor that recognizes outstanding achievements in research on the constitution and evolution of the Earth and other planets. Today, Tim will be introducing a series of presentations showcasing the discoveries, innovations, connections, and solutions that have led the Earth and space sciences to where they are today, 
Please join me in welcoming Tim Grove to the stage. Good afternoon. You folks already heard that my name is Tim Grove, and I'm chair of the AGU's Centennial Steering Committee. Welcome to the official opening of AGU's Centennial Celebration. Also, I'd like to acknowledge our online AGU Go audience. Thank you for joining us out there, wherever you are. Uh, during this session, we will hear 12 four-minute presentations on topics that span the breadth of AGU's science. Our goal today is to collectively highlight the past, the present, and the future of our science and its connection to society. I'm going to introduce presenters for four different neighborhoods. The first neighborhood is Deep Earth, and we're going to hear from Ross Stein, Tembler Inc., Louise Kellogg, University of California, Davis, and Christine Larson, University of Colorado, Boulder. Take it away. Let me bookend the greatest accomplishments in earthquake science during the last century. The first one began through the de total destruction of San Francisco in the great 1906 earthquake. And after the city burned to the ground, geologists from Berkeley and Stanford started walking the path of destruction to the north and the south. And they found a tear, a rent in the landscape, which they soon traced out over 300 miles, 450 kilometers, and they christened it the San Andreas Fault. And further, they found that whenever the fault crossed a road or a line of fences, it offset those features, and in a peculiar way, no matter which side you were on, the other side had been shoved to the right. These two sets of yellow dots were formally together. And they christened that right lateral fault slip. And then they brought the geodesists who made the gold rush shipping navigation maps back to San Francisco in the Bay Area to resurvey those monuments to figure out what was the broad pattern of deformation off the fault and not just on it. And what they discovered is in addition to that 12 or 15 feet of offset along the fault, the farther you got away from the fault, the lower the displacements got, like the fault had leaped ahead. And then H.F. Reed said, let's go back and look at the measurements that were made from the time of the gold rush in 1849 up until before the earthquake. And he found something truly astonishing. The entire Bay Area had been locked into a giant sheer vice. The earthquake wasn't the whole show. And what he realized was, if this had been going on, not just for 50 years, but for 250, if we add those displacements between earthquakes to what happened during the earthquake, we just get a simple offset. So the fault catches up when it's been strained for all this period. And what we end up with is a fault that has a long-term rate of displacement of an inch a year, two and a half centimeters a year. Now this was truly an astonishing discovery because even if the Earth was only 10 million years old, which was believed at the time, it would mean that the San Andreas had to displace the Earth 150 miles, 250 kilometers, utterly incompatible with the fixed and rigid Earth as it was believed then. This was the irrefutable evidence that the Earth's crust had to be mobile, and this seed would germinate for 60 years until the revolution of plate tectonics arrived. But there's another legacy of the Lawson report, which is that if this shear indicates where future earthquakes could occur, what we should be doing is measure shear, shearing all over the Earth. And today, with 30,000 continuous GPS instruments, we can actually see the shear associated with all of the faults, and so we know areas more likely to produce earthquakes. And there is the San Andreas system in the center. And now I want to take you to the upper corner in Alaska, where Alaska's San Andreas, the Denali Fault, crosses the planned route of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline that brings crude oil from Prudhoe Bay to Valdez. And the question was, what kind of displacement could that fault produce? And Lloyd Clough assembled a team of very young 
geologists who would all go on to brilliant careers to find the fault and to make that estimate. Here is the Denali in Alaska, right lateral just like the San Andreas. Here is the site where they discovered the greatest prehistoric slip in an earthquake, 38 feet. And at the site where the pipeline crosses the fault, here are their estimates of what the Alaska engineers needed to design for. Well, 30 years later, the magnitude 7.9 Denali earthquake struck, and here are its displacements. And not a drop of crude was released into that pristine Alaska wilderness. How did they do it? By, a, by building a telephone cord pipeline on Teflon skids. This is what happens when great science and engineering are joined, and this is why we are Earth scientists, to discover and protect. For the next few minutes, I'd like you to journey with me to the center of the Earth and back. As we sink through the floor of this building, we are looking at the history of our planet. Though the Earth's crust is ancient, it is mobile, and it has been moving for billions of years, with pieces of crust colliding with other sections of crust, pulling apart, folding, stretching, building mountains, and eroding them again. We know about this dynamic thanks to the, one of the most important scientific discoveries of the last century, the plate tectonic revolution. In this discovery, openly shared data plays a, a key role. In 1957, the International Geophysical Year, AGU scientists and others around the world broke through Cold War barriers. Scientists measured and shared their gravity, oceanographic, magnetic, seismic, and other geophysical data. Seismology in particular established a culture of sharing data from global networks of seismometers, active and passive seismic experience on the, in the oceans and on continents, regional and national seismic networks, and recently the ambitious decade-long EarthScope project. The energy from these earthquakes gives us vital information about the Earth's interior. The speed and path of the energy from each earthquake detected on seismometers adds to our picture of the composition, structure, state, and dynamics of the, of the planet. Sinking through the crust, we encounter the moho, the discontinuity between the crust and the mantle discovered more than a century ago. And below that, the upper mantle, a dynamic region that provides us with everything from upwellings under mid-ocean ridges to deep earthquakes at subduction zones. Under the elevated uh, pressures and temperatures of the Earth's deep interior, mantle rock responds to stress with slow, creeping flow. The resulting convection cools our planet, drives the motion of the tectonic plates, creates the ocean basins and the continents, and by shaping the surface, it makes possible life on Earth. The questions remain. We know the tectonic plates plunge into the interior at subduction zones, but we do not fully understand how this process begins or how it finishes. Our unprecedented images, such as this ancient subducted slab under North America, remain limited by both the range of the seismic network and by our understanding of the properties that make up the materials of the Earth's interior. Sinking further into the lower mantle, we now reach a vast reservoir of bridgmanite, the most abundant mineral on Earth. The seismic signal grows stronger, the features more difficult to interpret. Over the last two decades, the lower mantle has started to come into focus, revealing a complex set of structures where the mantle interacts with the core, and some of those structures perhaps are as old as the Earth itself. At last, we reach the Earth's center with a turbulent metal liquid outer core surrounding a solid metal inner core that's about the size of our moon. The convective turbulence of the outer core is the origin of the Earth's magnetic field. We've known for decades that the geodynamo originates in the Earth's outer core, but the underlying physics of this dynamo remain a grand challenge problem in 21st century geophysics, and computations helping to reveal those physics are being run even now by some of the world's largest computers using some of the world's most state-of-the-art scientific software. The chaotic dynamics of the magnetic field flipping back and forth, fi flipping its polarity back and forth, is recorded in the ocean crust, and that's what revealed the kinematics of plate tectonics. 
Yet to fully understand the Earth's interior dynamics, we need to go back out to the surface and on into space. We need to collect more observations about the magnetic field, record changes in the Earth's surface, and understand their effects on humans, humans and on technology. Thank you. OK, thank you. I'm going to talk about geodesy and how we have what we've done in the past, currently, and in the future. I want to first give a, a view to our past. Uh, William Bowie, a great geodesist, 100 years ago, helped co-found AGU. He was the first president of AGU. Uh, you can see these triangulation measurements, some of which Ross was talking about, which were used to understand plate boundary deformation early in those in the early days of AGU. Those triangulation measurements were very limited and uh, intensive to make. You had to be able to see from one geodetic monument to the next to make the measurements. So it was difficult to make those measurements, and they were limited. We've also seen that the plate tectonic revolution 50 years later, now we have a model that can explain some of the things that we saw in those early geodetic data in those early geodetic models, but how can we possibly test things on a global scale when, in fact, in, we have these very limited uh, regional measurements? So I just want you to take that model and think about what would that model, plate tectonic model, say about the surface? Those vectors there, the length of the vectors tell you how fast things are moving, and you can see that North America is predicted to go counterclockwise and Eurasia is predicted to go clockwise. How can you measure that with a triangulation system that we were using that was very limited to being able to see things regionally of a few hundred kilometers? Well, you need another revolution. You need a technological revolution. And I would say GPS has provided the first of those revolutions by triangulating to the skies instead of triangulating to your other sites on the surface. So GPS makes it possible to economically and accurately measure all those motions that you have models to predict and this is going to give you measurements that you need to test your models. This, in fact, is one of the most recent geodetic models. You can see that, in fact, the observed tectonic motions for North America and Eurasia are as predicted. Uh, Ross has also pointed out some of the strain along plate boundaries. Of course, this was also observed with GPS. On the left, you see the very complicated uh, uh, deformation across Asia that can be detected with GPS. The scale bar there, again, is showing you how fast things are moving. Uh, on the right-hand side, I've, I've shown one of the most amazing discoveries from GPS and geodesy in the last 20 years. This is tectonic episodic slip and tremor, where instead of things being steady, we now know that the deformation is time varying. So really critical discoveries from GPS and geodesy. Well, we've also been able to use GPS to innovate uh, not just measuring millimeters or centimeters per year, but in this case using the same instrument to measure tens of centimeters per second so that we can actually measure the deformation during an earthquake. Uh, there have also been um, people like myself that have been using the errors in GPS systems to turn them into environmental sensors. So on the top, we use signals that reflected off the snow to calculate how much snow falls every day. And that plot is shown on the right. Similarly, uh, this site in Alaska, we're able to use the reflections off the water surface to tell us tides. So simultaneously, we're using that to measure tectonic deformation. So three for the price of one. And finally, I wanted to call out to all the other satellite systems that are used by geodesists. It's not just GPS. We all work together. We measure things on different spatial and temporal scales, from global, global sea level rise to earthquake deformation with radars to ISAT and Gray's terrestrial water storage. Thank you. Thank you. So our next uh, neighborhood of talks is Earth Covering. It's going to be Earth, Wind, and Fire. It's going to be Jay, F yeah, it's not the band. It's going to be Jay Famletti, uh, Global Institute for Water Security, University of Saskatchewan, Richard Alley, Penn State University, and Catherine Hayhoe, Texas Tech University. Thanks, Thanks Tim. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about water. 
Um, in fact, um, among the most palpable impacts of global change are changes to the water cycle. We are watching as the frequency and the intensity of flooding and drought um, is increasing. Uh, we're watching patterns of rainfall shift and we're expecting that the wet areas of the world will be getting wetter and the dry areas of the world will be getting drier. We're watching as the ice sheets and glaciers and snow and permafrost is melting away and driving up sea level rise. But one of the things that we haven't been able to watch as carefully because we really haven't had the appropriate measurements is how fresh water availability is changing and what that is going to mean for our water security, our food security, our energy, and our human security. Are we going to have enough water to grow enough food and to produce enough energy for a rapidly growing population in the face of a rapidly changing climate? So interestingly, this isn't a question that we, we really have spent a lot of time thinking about in hydrology. We've made assumptions about stationarity of hydrologic processes. We recognize that there's great spatial temporal variability in things like rainfall and snowpack, but we haven't really allowed for uh, shifts in those variations. And, and freshwater availability, to, uh, terrestrial water storage, is a great example of, of this. If we look in a hydrology textbook, it's a pretty good bet that we'll see that the DSDT term, the delta S, the change in storage in all of the snow, surface water, soil moisture, groundwater in a river basin is equal to zero on annual time scales. And we did this for a couple of reasons. One, we could solve for unknowns like evapotranspiration, but also, um, also um, we just didn't have the measurements. Um, and so, in, in fact, there's very few places around the world where we make measurements of all the water in a river basin and how it's changing over time, and that's true even, t uh, even till today. So all of that changed with the launch of the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment uh, in, 2000 and, in 2002. Grace measured the tiny variations, space-time variations in Earth's gravity field. They're primarily caused by the movement of water over the globe. Grace effectively worked like a scale in the sky, weighing the large regions of the Earth that are gaining or losing water mass on monthly and longer time scales. And so the science team was able to produce uh, these unprecedented, unprecedented maps of how freshwater availability changed throughout the course of the, um, uh, throughout the mission, the 15-year lifetime of the mission. And so we saw, in fact, that the wet areas of the world are getting wetter, just as the IPCC predicts and the dry areas of the world are getting drier, and we can quantify the rates at which that's happening, and we see that it's happening now. We can see that the ice sheets are melting away and the rates at which they're doing so. We can quantify the rates of glacier melt, the rates at which hydrologic extremes of flooding and drought are changing, and we can see that groundwater depletion is a global phenomenon. In fact, we can see that over half of the world's major aquifer systems are past sustainability tipping points. They're being mined, mainly to provide the water for irrigation to grow food. So we can see that global freshwater security and therefore global food security are at far greater risk than we ever imagined. So where does this leave us in AGU hydrology? What role are we gonna play in moving the needle on, on global water security? I think uh, we'll be seeing much more collaboration with social, economic, and political scientists into the next few decades, certainly much more engagement with stakeholders and engagement at least on the science side of policy. I fully expect that we'll be doing the important science that underlies the much needed transboundary water, energy, and food policy. Finally, I wanna make a uh, a plea to my, my fellow water scientists out there to embrace your roles as, as uh, science communicators and to refine your skills because if people don't understand the work that we do and its implications for food security, for mobilizing future uh, waves of climate refugees, for increasing violent conflict, then um, the maps that I showed you today and our global water future will be extremely difficult to change. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jay. Um, this is um, a picture of a hurricane arriving in New England in 1938. Uh, this is at the Battery 
it arrived essentially without warning. Uh, this is what it did to Mystic Seaport. Uh, this is what it did to New London. It killed about 600 people in New England who did not get out of the way. Uh, this is a, uh, the aftermath of a hurricane that arrived in Galveston in 1900. With little warning, it killed roughly 8,000 people. In the modern world, there are vastly more people in the, in the line of danger. The storms may be bigger, the sea level is higher, and the storm surge is worse as a consequence. And in the developed world where we can get out of the way, death tolls have plummeted. More people in greater danger and fewer dying. And this is why, this is the history of error in hurricane track forecasts. When I was in middle school, you did not have 24 hours warning whether you were going to be in the hurricane strength winds of a large storm. Today, you have more than 72 hours warning. You can get out of the way. What underlies this is a vast range of students sitting there trying to understand dynamics and thermodynamics and radiative transfer. This is the science is fantastic. Incredibly improved models implementing that science, running on much better computers. The data collection, the satellites have changed our ability to view, but there's still heroes flying through the storms. There are still people putting the drones out and other sorts of things. And then this revolution in putting the data and the models together, data assimilation and Kalman filters and all of this wonderful stuff. There are Scholarly studies that show that the investment in weather forecasting pays dividends of 300 to 1,000 percent. It enables a, a private weather forecast industry that is making business that work better, growing more food, and doing more good. Okay? Once you have good weather forecasts, you can do so many other things. You get the ocean right, you have the storm surge. You get the rain right and the rivers and the runoff from the groundwater, and you have floods. You, energy demand goes up and down with the weather. Energy supply from renewables goes up and down with the weather. You can forecast these and match supply and demand. Um, you will hear a little bit more coming. Uh, there are people who should not be out exercising when smoke is coming. We can forecast smoke now. Um, as the Arctic opens in the summer, that last boat full of cars, that last boat full of tourists are in danger of being trapped in the sea ice, you can predict sea ice. Uh, crop yields and drought and famine and national security issues become predictable, right? They can predict bird migrations now. If you didn't see this paper, on the top is a forecast, on the bottom is what happened, in the middle is the vertical profile. If you want to change the lights in your your skyscraper or change the operation of your wind turbines to save the migrating birds, you can do that now, right? This is fantastic. Now, if you run that model longer, it becomes a climate model. Climate models are skillful. Climate models do give us the ability to make choices. The Nobel Prize in Economics this year to William Nordhaus of Yale for demonstrating essentially that we can make wise choices about where to put our investments and that the optimal future always involves investing some in heading off climate change. That's the Nobel Prize in economics. The economy is better off if we deal with this wisely. If you took the IPCC and squeezed it into a tweet, compared to business as usual, an efficient response will give a larger economy. It will give more jobs, greater national security, improved health, and a cleaner environment more consistent with the golden rule. And Catherine will say a little bit more about this in just a moment. But science well used improves our well-being. Let's keep jumping in. Thank you. Since the days of the ancient Greeks, natural philosophers, or scientists as we call ourselves now, have viewed the world as a vast firmament governed by immutable natural laws. But over the last hundred years, one of the most important lessons we have learned is that a more accurate view of our planet is this one, an image of the world at night, where it shows the lights of the nearly seven and a half billion people who now spread across this planet. 
Now, we've known for a long time that humans could affect the Earth on a regional or a local scale. Back in medieval England, deforestation was so rampant that they soon had to turn to burning coal. And it wasn't long before coal created a terrible air pollution. It was so bad that King Edward I, in the early 1300s, said that when his queen was in residence in the Tower of London, no one was allowed to burn coal. The kilns had to be shut off. The penalty for that first piece of air quality legislation was, I believe, death. But we never dreamed that that same air pollution would lead to something so vast and so massive that it would be causing our entire planet to dim at the same time as greenhouse gases caused it to warm. And we certainly never imagined back 100 years ago or more that we would actually be mimicking the effects of pollution and even volcanoes in an attempt to possibly geoengineer the entire planet. Early experiments with nuclear weapons never imagined that we'd be using them to track ocean circulation through the signature that they left on our planet. And scientists warned that they could even end up creating a nuclear winter. When we first got those spray cans and those refrigerants, we never dreamed that they would be causing a hole in the entire ozone level. And we certainly never knew when we first started digging up and burning coal and gas and oil, although by the 1850s we did know, that these would be building up in the atmosphere, trapping more heat, causing the temperature of the planet to warm, and also increasingly causing our oceans to acidify. Today, we know that we are conducting an unprecedented experiment with the only home that we have. That is the most significant advance that we have made in understanding our role on this planet. But because we understand the human agency, that actually is part of what gives us hope. I study the impact of different future scenarios, RCPs, or increasingly the changes we see per degree of warming. And I know that by doing so, we can actually dynamically alter the probability of these scenarios, like Schrodinger's cat. Because if you didn't quantify a higher scenario, why would you ever want to avoid it? So I want to close with one tangible example of how we can not inadvertently, but inadvertently and deliberately step in to intervene with our planet. A study that I had the honor to lead 15 years ago looked at the impacts on California for a higher and a lower scenario. We studied the impacts that were very relevant to the state. Sierra Nevada snowpack, wildfire, specialty crops. And a year later, when Governor Schwarzenegger became the first governor to sign into place mandatory greenhouse gas emission reduction targets for the state of California in Executive Order S305, he did so with a ring of our authors behind him. So today, we know, a hundred years later, that although we can see our planet through our eyes in space like this, the reality is that our planet rests in our own hands today. Thank you. All right, so now for our uh, next neighborhood beyond Earth. Uh, we have Scott Rulowski from NOAA, uh, Nicola Fox from NASA, and Jonathan Lunin from Cornell University. Well, good afternoon. Uh, Scott Rudlowski here representing the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and also one of the smallest AGU sections, Atmospheric and Space Electricity. I'm here to show that lightning is everywhere. So our ability to record lightning has improved drastically over the years, revealing fascinating new features, only some of which had even been theorized. This high-speed video here illustrates a positive cloud-to-ground flash, which in turn induces an upward cloud-to-ground flash that eventually dominates the scene, lighting up the entire sky. The brightening of the channel indicates times when new pockets of charge are reached by streamers at the opposite end of this flash. This flash likely covered thousands of square kilometers and generated very low frequency radio waves that were detectable around the globe, globe by sensors, uh, sparsely placed sensors. So it turns out that lightning emits energy over much of the electromagnetic spectrum. Dense networks of radio antennas are able to pinpoint lightning in very high spatial and temporal resolution, even showing when and where the current is flowing. 
In this case, the ground-based radio observations are being used to validate optical lightning observations from space, indicated by the pink stars and boxes. The image on the lower left superimposes the radio observations with a lightning photograph to illustrate lightning striking a great distance from the parent thunderstorm, well away from the most obvious threat. So this eye-catching video here depicts data from two revolutionary instruments on NOAA's new Gozar series spacecraft. The advanced baseline imager images the clouds, and the lightning, as measured by the geo geostationary lightning mapper, is illustrated by brightening clouds and yellow lines. And what I want to note here is how far the lightning is propagating back behind the main line of storms here, and also that the GLM is able to depict the full spatial extent of these individual lightning flashes. And so we now have two GLMs in orbit covering mo most of the Western Hemisphere, and they're already providing fascinating new insights to researchers and weather forecasters as documented in this geophysical research letter. A uh, European astronaut aboard the International Space Station caught this wonderful video which illustrates that lightning is not confined to Earth's lower atmosphere. Ob described by observers for over a century but only recently confirmed, blue jets appear as bright blue flashes above the thunder thunderstorms in the center right of this image. Further left, fainter red sprites appear much higher above the thunderstorm. Scientists have shown that these transient luminous events are, provide very important insights into the lower tropospheric flashes that produce them, and these insights can be used to help improve public safety. The lightning plays a very important role in maintaining Earth's electric field. And amazingly, the global electric circuit is able to capture or it integrates global changes in the frequency, intensity, and scale of electrified weather into a single measurable quantity that has been measured for over a century now. Carnegie curves that were derived from observing the fair weather return current aboard ships in the early 20th century match very well with Carnegie curves that are derived from multi-sensor observations of the thunderstorm sources in more modern times. This is just one example of why it's so important to observe lightning and the signals it generates. And only time confines my discussion to the near-Earth near environment. Light, many important missions have shown lightning on other planets, and I've shown a couple examples there. Uh, it turns out as well that our, our lightning imagers are able to help scientists characterize, detect and characterize meteors as they enter the Earth's atmosphere. This has introduced scientists across disciplines who are enthusiastic, enthusiastically pursuing new research and operational applications. Thank you. The sun, our star, a constant in our life, and yet the dynamic environment of this star would be described as anything but constant, capable of throwing out billions of tons of material hurtling out into space at millions of miles an hour. These events will impact our space in the solar system. Despite being protected by our magnetosphere, the energy and the material from these events enters into our magnetic environment, causing large-scale changes with the possibility of crippling spacecraft, destroying power grids, and seriously adversely affecting our ability to communicate. This is space weather. What a lot of people don't know is it is not just these really big events that are occurring um, in our star. Every day, all the time, there is a constant outflow of our solar material. This was discovered in 1958 by a young researcher, Dr. Eugene Parker, who wrote a paper where he solved some math equations and he came up with the prediction of how this environment would work. A number of years later, in 1962, it was found observationally by the Mariner 2 spacecraft to be correct. It is one of the mysteries in our sun's corona. Why is this material continually accelerated? Why is the corona itself 300 times hotter than the surface of the sun? And why do we accelerate very, very high energy particles when we see these big transient events? The only way to go and unlock these mysteries is to actually journey into the environment of our star. 
60 years later, NASA launched the most ambitious space mission, the Parker Solar Probe. She launched August 12th of this year and has already started her historic journey. Faster, hotter, closer than anything has ever been to our star. Traveling at blistering speeds of up to 430,000 miles an hour, going closer to within 4 million miles of our sun's surface, and traveling through the searing heat of the corona at 3 million degrees. This is not a simple mission. This is the most autonomous spacecraft to ever be launched. No one can help Parker Solar Probe if she has a problem. She has to be able to look after herself. Materials had to be invented that would withstand this incredible temperature. Facing temperatures of more than 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit on the heat shield that protects Parker Solar Probe, and then traveling out again to the planet, around the planet Venus, where we uh, are plunged into the extreme cold of space. 24 orbits, we use Venus to take us closer and closer. Parker Solar Probe has already made her first journey through the corona, and we were delighted this week to see the tantalizing data that we know is going to unlock these mysteries. Popular science called her the single greatest innovation of 2018. I call her the coolest, hottest mission under the sun. She is Parker Solar Probe. With planetary exploration, scientists send their instruments out into the solar system to address the big issues of how planets formed, why our Earth is habitable, and whether life exists beyond the Earth itself. Are we alone in the cosmos? The long prehistory of planetary exploration involved observations with optical telescopes that were so difficult that scientists could apply their own presuppositions to uh, their interpretations of these observations of the planets, and therefore could come to astonishingly wrong conclusions. A hundred years ago, at the birth of the AGU, Percival Lowell, an American astronomer, saw straight lines on the surface of Mars through his telescope, and he interpreted these straight lines as being canals that were drawing water from the poles of Mars to supply a global civilization of Martians that were dying of thirst. Fifty years ago, those imaginings were destroyed by the early Mariner probes. Mariner 4 and Mariner 6 and 7 showed a Mars that looked very much like the moon. Venus, which was thought to be a tropical paradise in the early part of the 20th century, turned out to have a surface temperature above the melting point of lead. But it turns out that the history of these planets is far more nuanced and far more interesting than the early history of planetary exploration suggested. On Mars, with rovers and sophisticated orbiting vehicles, we now know that the early history of Mars, the first billion years, Mars was habitable. It had liquid water on its surface. Life might have begun and evolved during that time. And so that leaves us with a mystery as to how this small planet could have been habitable at a time when our own sun was 30% less luminous than it is today. In the outer solar system, planetary exploration has discovered for us a suite of bodies that have liquid water underneath their surfaces, the so-called ocean worlds of the solar system. Three of them definitively have oceans whose properties have been characterized and the one whose properties have been best characterized is Saturn's moon Enceladus, which has a plume of gas and ice pouring out of its south pole. And uh, in this picture that you see here, the sun is illuminating that plume at the bottom and a thin crescent at the top. Saturn is illuminating the disk of Enceladus, and the background gray that you see in the longer exposures is the graveyard of this material, Saturn's E-ring. 
Cassini flew seven times through this plume and was able to measure with mass spectrometers its composition and establish that the ocean, in fact, is habitable. It can support life. But does it support life? Well, that's for the next 50 years of planetary exploration, to go to these worlds, to make the measurements, to determine whether, in fact, microbial life exists there, to see whether the biochemistry is similar to that of the Earth, as on the left, with maybe some variations, or in the methane lakes and seas on the surface of Titan, perhaps a completely different biochemistry is there to challenge our concept of what life really is. But in doing this, we have to be cognizant of what Carl Sagan said in his last book with Andrewian, published the year of his death, in which he said there are indeed marvels to be seen out there in the solar system, but we cannot repeat the mistakes of 100 years ago. We cannot imprint our presuppositions to create marvels. We have to approach the exploration with a skeptical and open and scientific mind in the best tradition of this union. Thank you. So our final topic is Science Nexus, and our speakers are John Balbus, National Institutes of Health, uh, Peter Fox, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and Daniel Schretzer, um, uh, Pont de... We call it Paris Tech. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Balbus. I'm with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and representing our new GeoHealth Nexus section. Now, this is a room of people who know a lot about a lot of things. And I don't want to make anybody feel bad, but a lot of people do not understand just how huge a burden of harm to health comes from environmental exposures. The World Health Organization has estimated that as many as one in four deaths around the world are related to environmental exposures, most of these related to unsafe air and water. Over 90% of these deaths are occurring in low and middle income countries. And as people have grown richer and more capable of cleaning our air and water, the burden associated with specific types of exposures have changed. More people die now from what we're calling, might be called modern pollution, air pollution mostly from, from fossil fuel combustion and industrial chemical exposures, and fewer people from those uh, sources of pollution that are most associated with poverty, like unsafe water and air pollution from indoor cooking and heating. And the places where people are experiencing these health effects are also shifting over time. But as you can see, the numbers are still high. Outdoor air pollution alone is responsible for more than three and a half million deaths a year, and that's more than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. So with such a high burden, why is awareness so low? Well, one reason is because even the most lethal air pollution, things like fine particles and ozone air pollution, are invisible. Well, almost invisible. And this is where Earth observations and Earth scientists, like we have here at AGU, come in and help protect public health. So this is a video from our friends at NASA. It shows sulfate aerosols, mostly from coal burning. And with remote sensing, you can see where this toxic air pollution is coming from. And if you look closely in the, at the United States, you can almost see the path of the Ohio River, where so many of these uh, coal-fired power plants are, are burning. You can see many of the coal-fired power plants in Eastern Europe, um, almost like uh, people blowing out smoke rings. And if you look where the hottest signal is, it's in South and Southeast Asia. Um, and what you can see in a, a demonstration like this is where these, this air pollution goes. Our air pollution is breathed in by people in England. And even in San Francisco, which has relatively good air quality, almost a quarter of the fine particulates they breathe are coming across the Pacific Ocean from China. Now, along with these sulfate aerosols that cool our planet come climate forcers, both short-lived, like black carbon, and long-lived, like carbon dioxide. And the climate change associated with these climate forces also has a myriad of health impacts. And climate change is also very hard for people to see. But again, our friends with the remote sensing 
can help us with this. Earth observations can make visible events that are caused or worsened by climate change and harm our health, especially if air and wind are involved. So this is a video that's showing smoke plumes from wildfires, and we know wildfires create health emergencies, not just where they're occurring, but hundreds of miles downwind. And you can see the smoke plumes here from the tremendous fires, fires that we had in the western United States and northwest Canada, uh, as well as other parts of the world. The lighter blue is uh, the pass of hurricanes, and we know the hurricanes have myriad health effects, not just the immediate death and injuries caused by the storms, but we're understanding now that the, the legacy of, of the health legacy of hurricanes runs a long time, including mental health impacts and um, problems with access to health care, as we're understanding after Hurricane Marie in Puerto Rico. And then lastly, the, the yellowish um, signal there are, are uh, mineral dusts. You can see the mineral dusts coming off the Sahara Desert, um, where in uh, sub-Saharan Africa they're associated with meningitis. They contain silicates that can be irritating and affect the immune system. And in the southwest United States, climate worsened droughts can cause a disease called coccidiomycosis that comes along with the dusts there. So where are we headed in geohealth? I'm going to leave you with three things. Detect and document, and why do we want to do that? In order to raise awareness and raise this understanding and motivate policies to control exposures. Connect and understand so we can understand exposure pathways and assess the burden of disease associated with them. And lastly, to predict better. And why do we want to predict better? So that we can prevent disease and protect public health. Thanks very much. G'day, how are you going? Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the new wave, the hype, if you like, big data, a little bit about artificial intelligence. Um, I think some of us hopefully have natural intelligence, not necessarily artificial intelligence. And for the geoscience audience, um, my real theme is going to be grounded in um, a, a pro uh, some projects that I've been involved in, because I want to just say to you, be wary of a data scientist who's never worked in a field before telling you about your science. And uh, <clears throat> what, uh, what we have in front of us, we have a tremendous amount of technology. Um, that's not my slide. That's not my slide either. That's not my slide. That's my slide, but uh, can we go back? Here we go. That's my slide. Good luck over there. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I want to pose a very small problem, um, and that is how do we study the coevolution of the geosphere and the biosphere over the entire history of Earth? Okay. So I think that's a pretty substantial problem. And in reality, a lot of a tremendous amount of work over centuries has been performed by geoscientists, geologists, uh, paleontologists. And in looking at this problem from a data perspective, it's a big data problem. The volume isn't big, but the diversity, the heterogeneity, and the incompleteness, the sparseness of the data is a tremendous challenge. And it's only really in the last five years that we've been able to get our heads around it. And so what we want to do is look at mineral record, fossil records, and even protein records. And uh, we need to rescue data from the literature because a tremendous amount has been published, but it's not digitally available. We want to assemble it in a form that makes sense for our mineralogists, our paleontologists, and our, um, and our biologists. Aggregate it and um, understand how it relates to existing resources, which ones have, have decent quality and which ones don't. But most importantly, I come to you from the informatics, your informatics section of AGU. Uh, 13 years young, but a vibrant organization where domain scientists, informaticians, computer scientists get together and work on small problems, big problems in small teams and in large teams. And what we want to be able to do is leverage and innovate our science in discovery science mode, breaking away into an integrative mode rather than a purely reductionist mode. And uh, the way in which we um, get at that is through a number of visual analytics techniques. So in the, in the upper left is a diagram which shows the evolution of mineral co-occurrence over 4.5 billion years of history. 
in the upper right is a skyline diagram which represents all currently known mineral forming elements from the first row of the, um, uh, the transition metals that's on the right horizontal axis, relative abundance, and on the left horizontal axis is all of Earth's history. And so the ups and downs are the opening and closing of the oceans and the continents. That's the supercontinent cycle. And it's got the ionization oxidation states there, which provide the availability for forming amino acids and forming potentially forming life. And we can form networks of minerals. So it turns out that minerals have a social life. They have actually have a better social life than we do. And we can use these mineral networks to um, predict where minerals will occur. At the same time, because fossils give us an important record, so over the last 500, uh, 550 million years in the Cambrian, we can study the evolution of mineral networks and understand what they're telling us about extinctions and the co-occurrence of minerals in relation to those fossils. And these visual techniques can not only tell us about mass extinctions, but they can tell us about minor extinctions through the clumping of these network diagrams. And these can be quantified in ways in which we've never been able to done before. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this short presentation was uh, prepared with Hervé Lutreut from the Institute Simon Laplace and Timothy Dixon from South Florida University. Myself, I'm from Ecole des Ponts Paris Tech, by the way. Okay, why to speak about cities in a geophysical society? That could be surprising at a given level, because the cities occupy only a very tiny fraction of the Earth's surface. Nevertheless, they have to host most of the world population growth for the next decades, as they have done already. And they are also uh, the sources of most human impacts on climate. At the same time, they are subject to numerous geophysical threats. Therefore, there is a question, how to go from short term mismanagement of resources and risk to a wider monitoring of the geophysical environment. This challenge was in, in, in fact addressed by the United Nations during its last assemb the assembly of 2015, where there was a plan of a UN 2030 agenda for sustainable development with 17 goals, which include one about cities, their resilience and sustainability. In fact, this goal conditions the success of more, more or less all or almost all the other goals. Further to this, following these uh, general assemblies have been also various important international agreements, including, for example, the Shandai framework on how to invest for resilience, the COP21, also called Paris Agreement, which is so much appreciated here in Washington, and Habitat 3. What about geophysical threats? There are many examples of them. One which is maybe underestimated is the question of ground subsidence and its particular role in the case of Katrina. Here you have a map which is based on radar stat number one on the subsidence rate in New Orleans. Orange and red correspond to fast subsidence. There is a, now there is a close-up of that, and you can see red spots all along the MRGO canal. And that was where there will be the main failures of the defense of, Cat of uh, New Orleans against Katharina. In fact, the subsidence was a rich value of one meter for certain spots, which means that the defense were no longer able to stand a, a, a cyclone of category three. Here is a map of the damages and breaches resulting from Katarina. 
there are many of them. That means that a small spot where the defense is going ba bad could uh, endanger all the system. Unfortunately, there is not only subsidence for big events, but very common events such as sunny days flooding, not only in Miami, but now all along the eastern coast of the U.S., including the fact that it could reach 60 days per year. Now, I have just a short time to mention the question of uh, resilience and adaptation to, uh, clim to climate change. There is a large-scale investigation in the region of France called Aquitaine, uh, which includes several important cities, including Bordeaux, which has more than one million inhabitants. And the idea was to involve a lot of scientists in it, at least 400 of them. They face a very complex problem, ranging from biology to geophysics and different things like that, and including society. The question was that, in fact, without engagement of society, society there are difficulties to do anything. At the same time, there was a step by step the recognition that there is a need for a kind of new branch of science, which is the science for adaptation of cities or a region to climate change, which involved at the same time drastic development of nonlinear techniques to take into account the complexity of the system which are involved. Thank you. So thanks to the speakers and to all of you in the audience for part participating in our official opening of AGU's uh, centennial celebration. So now that we have begun this celebration, let me encourage each one of you to go to your communities and institutions and celebrate our 100 years of science and the opportunities that tomorrow will bring. Go out and do it.